oftentimes groups, countries, different types of institutions struggle to stay for very long periods of time. For anyone who's ever run an organization, you'll know that keeping it alive for a year, let alone 10, 100, or even a thousand years uh, is difficult. And one of the things I wanna talk about today is narrative, story. It's probably one of the most human things you can possibly imagine. What is conversation except for telling each other stories about ourselves, our beliefs, our thoughts, or, you know, what happened last night with the Raptors? Did something happen last night with the Raptors? I'm not gonna check. We, as humans, with this squishy human brain, seem to need story in order for the world to make sense. For us to belong to something like a family, a club, a political affiliation, a country, really requires some sort of narrative that puts you as one piece in a larger story moving somewhere. And when we don't have narrative, things seem disjointed, incomplete, and honestly traumatic. There are some scholars of memory studies who think that things like PTSD and trauma are created in part because when we are subject to trauma, we are unable to process what happened into the narrative of our lives. So stories are important. They're how we live and how we organize memories. Stories have made nations from the United States with its founding fathers and constitution to Bolivia with Simon de Bolivar. There's Canada with its... I'm sure there's a story somewhere. But what we're gonna talk today is about one country with a story that made it last literally thousands of years in many different forms. And this narrative is something that the country that we're going to today, which is in China, would return to again and again and again. It's called the Mandate of Heaven, and it began under a chapter of Chinese history known as the Zhou Dynasty. And the Zhou Dynasty is going to be this episode's dead country. It was the longest reigning Chinese dynasty, lasting almost 800 years. And with the Mandate of Heaven, it would build the narrative institution that would create and maintain China as an entity. China. So how did the Zhou Dynasty begin? It started as a military overthrow of a previous dynasty, the first Chinese dynasty that can be historically verified to exist. There is one that some people consider older, but it's very likely that that one is entirely mythological. So this was the Shang Dynasty. And the overthrow was brutal, and there are legends that said that the Shang Emperor literally fed the future king of the Zhou Dynasty his relatives in the form of meat cakes as like a form of punishment. And as part of the narrative of the Zhou dynasty and further Chinese dynasties, the idea that the king would do something so dark and so improper and so not virtuous was an important thing to mention. When the Zhou finally took over China and ousted the Shang dynasty, they put relatives in powerful positions, creating a bunch of feudal titles. And from this period forward, there would be two uh, Zhou dynasties, one called the Western Zhou dynasty and one called the Eastern Zhou dynasty. And the reason that there have different names is basically there's an upset where one switches to the other in sort of a bloody upheaval, but we'll talk about that in a second. Let's begin with the Western Zhou dynasty. This was probably the high watermark of Zhou power. This was a period of expansion where uh, the Chinese empire at the period where it was at got to its largest extent, even before there was really a concept of China. The feudal system that was put in place was called the Fengjian system. By the way, I already apologize in advance for the terrible Chinese pronunciation. And like a lot of early feudal governments, it was actually very decentralized. Those dukes that were different relatives of the king of the Zhou dynasty had a lot of power and a lot of autonomy. This worked perfectly fine when all of the leaders were relatives of each other, and so, you know, they were more or less on each other's sides. But as generations moved on and on, as anybody who's played Crusader Kings 2 will know, the less related you get to all of these dynastic rulers, the more the relationships and alliances that kept the glue of the Zhou dynasty together began to strain. Peripheral territories were starting to get more power, and a lot of the power of these nobles were starting to rival the Zhou king himself. Then there was a major conflict when the Zhou queen was demoted to concubine because the king wanted to raise up a different concubine that he was closer to. 
That queen, however, was related to another one of those major nobles, which caused a serious period of upheaval. The queen that the family belonged to rose up in rebellion against the king and raided the city, the capital city of the Zhao dynasty, the city of Hao. That Zhou King was deposed and put in place by a council of nobles afterwards was a new Zhou King, which was the grandson of the previous Zhou King. And part of this grandson's ascension to the throne involved moving the capital of the Zhou dynasty from Hao to Wang Cheng. This is the upheaval and transition that I mentioned when we go from a period called the Western Zhou to the Eastern Zhou. The period of the Eastern Zhou is a time of the royal authority of the Zhou dynasty starting to crumble and collapse. Oftentimes you'll hear references to this era of the Zhou dynasty as the spring and autumn period. The king started to lose centralized authority and became more of a ritualistic figurehead, kind of like the Holy Roman Emperor in you know early modern Europe. And in this period, there was a lot of warfare between the different rulers within the Zhou dynasty. Although they couldn't go to full war because because the stakes were low, they were still under one big kingdom, they did have these small-scale warfare things with uh, knights and some fancy soldiers, but they were very small, and in many ways they were kind of exaggerated duels. They were more fighting over issues of honor and didn't really have much geopolitical stakes. So this period, you can probably guess, is a little chaotic. It's not going to be as chaotic as things will get in the future, but still, things were troublesome. However, in this straining time, there were some amazing developments, especially in the idea of governance and philosophy. The Zhou dynasty is the period where Confucius developed the ideas that would then become Confucianism, which I'm gonna give a brief description of, but I think I'm gonna have to make my own Confucianism video at some point. That is, if Kogito doesn't get to it first. More or less, Confucius saw these rulers ruling like despots using brutal violence to uh, f rule through fear, essentially. Confucius did not like this idea. He thought that this was not a way to rule for indefinite periods of time. This is a recipe for your own destruction, basically. So what Confucius proposed is that a great leader, one that will build a dynasty that will last generations and generations, is one that is such a virtuous and good person themselves that the people that they're ruling over will go along with their decrees because of their belief in them. There will be no coercion necessary. Just like how the king acted as a father to the state, there was a strong emphasis in relationships and the tight relationships of family, especially from fathers towards their sons, which is called filial loyalty. I talk a little bit about it in my video on Mulan, which you can check out. And Confucius wrote the same golden rule that many other philosophers have over the years, treat others the way you wish to be treated. Another big philosopher of this period who might be mythical or partly mythical and might have been contemporary with Confucius or might not have been is the philosopher Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu was the philosopher or likely several philosophers who wrote the Wei or uh, the Tao as it's called in Chinese and is a reference to Tao or Taoism, which is another large philosophical religious movement in China that I definitely should talk about more in depth in its own video, again, if Kogito doesn't beat me to it. Taoism is the philosophy between yin and yang, and what it emphasizes is adaptability and accepting the chaos of the universe as having an underlying order behind it all, and that a Taoist will accept and adapt and move with the flow of the world. It's a philosophy of patience, and of making sure that things, friendships, nature, development, all happens on its own cycle and shouldn't be rushed. Now, Lao Tzu, Confucius, and the Buddha are probably the three most important figures in Chinese spirituality and East Asian spirituality in general. And so there's actually a little story about the three of them that says a lot about the three different philosophies. Essentially, the story goes that Confucius, the Buddha, and Lao Tzu all tasted vinegar and described how they saw the taste. Confucius described the taste of vinegar as sour, referencing that it is just one piece of a world that is full of degeneracy and needs stability and strong institutions to keep it flowing. The Buddha said that the vinegar tasted bitter because of the bitter suffering and the enduring that comes with being trapped in the cycle of samsara, which we talked about a little bit in my Buddhism video. And Lao Tzu, 
said that the vinegar tasted sweet. Because even though it's a flavor that he might not personally enjoy, he knows that it's part of a greater system, something that is harmonious and beautiful. Now, around the 5th century BCE, different states within the Zhou dynasty started to leave and declare independence. And in 344 BCE, the Duke of Wei declared himself a king, on par with the King of Zhao, and many other former dukes within the Zhou Kingdom followed suit. What this would lead to is a period called the Period of the Warring States, which was basically a dynastic war to see which of these rulers would become the next official dynasty. The Zhou Kingdom continued, but it was extraordinarily small. Eventually, though, the Qin Dynasty would become the winner and would become the next official dynasty in the list of dynasties. And in this period, that is when iron started to become a common occurrence. Bronze was actually the major thing that they were into because bronze is brilliant. But iron has a wonderful effect. It's not as good as bronze, but it is cheaper. But in this period, the small-scale warfare that happened at the high watermark of the Zhou Dynasty was gone and replaced with absolute war with the goal of winning and conquering territory. And it was in this period that a legendary commander came to write an important meditation on the ideas of warfare that had become one of the most widely read books in history. I'm of course talking about the legendary general and writer Sun Tzu and his book, The Art of War. Now Sun Tzu's major thing was uh, applying the principles of Taoism to warfare. His work would redefine Asian war tactics and very much under Taoist principles we talked about earlier, he would make sure to adapt to what the enemy was doing, focusing on information deception and attacking the enemy where it is weakest and dividing it if you are overpowered and not necessarily about having the bigger or smaller army. You can see the different mentalities towards warfare that someone who would be a student of Sun Tzu would take as opposed to like say a European scholar of war in the military strategy games of Go and chess. Chess very much about tactics, while Go is about strategy and controlling areas. And it's this difference in thinking that led to completely outnumbered militaries like say the North Vietnamese to defend their state against the invasion of the United States in the 1960s and 70s and eventually get their liberation. So when the Qin Dynasty took over from the Zhou Dynasty, one of the things that they said that delegitimized the Zhou claim to the title of king was that they had lost the mandate of heaven. It was an idea that was developed by the Zhou Dynasty themselves when they took over the Shang Dynasty. And it was an idea that the ruler of this land will have peace and prosperity as long as the ruler keeps living a virtuous life lives up to Confucian ideals, and, and lives up to the status of being a good king, a just king, and one who looks after their state as the state looks after them. But when a leader loses their virtue, they might be cursed with unrest, with natural disasters, signs that they have lost the mandate of heaven, that the gods in the sky no longer think that they are worthy of rule. And it's in that time when the ruler has lost the mandate of heaven that those who are virtuous can, nay, must stand up and overthrow this regime in favor of a new one. The Zhou used it to justify their takeover of the Shang, and this would continue through every Chinese dynasty all the way up until the final emperor in 1911, which is a idea of a country so ancient that it's almost impossible to conceive of. So many thousands of years of continuous institutions, uh, the idea of China is unimaginable. So it seems the mandate of heaven is a very compelling story. And I would argue that any good institution, any good movement has to have a compelling narrative. I was having a conversation with YouTuber Mia Mulder the other day, by the way, you should subscribe to her, she's great. And she kind of mentioned that we are at this crossroads of human history, that Really, even in like concrete ways, we have no idea how to plan out what's going to be happening in our world, even in the next 10 years, let alone the next 20 or 30. We are sort of traumatized in the sense that we don't have a narrative. We don't really have a vision of where the world is going or where any of our individual countries are going. We lack a story and it's very uncomfortable. The whole neoliberal fantasy that things are just gonna always be getting better forever as free markets and free trade and freedom and free, free and stuff and history being over and all that kind of stuff wraps up this grand narrative. And 
that's starting to tarnish and fall apart and we don't really have anything to set up what's next. So the Mandate of Heaven is what kept China together as an entity through so many periods of upheaval and revolution. But I would argue that politics and institution building benefit more from having a compelling narrative, one that is more compelling than, say, competing narratives at any given time, than even having good ideas or good policy. If we're in a period of collective trauma, of not knowing where we go from here, one of the things that psychologists that work with people with post-traumatic stress disorder do is try to get them to think about whatever traumatic event happened in their life and contextualize it within a greater narrative to make it one chapter of a larger story. And in many ways, whenever a state is overthrown, the new state needs to rewrite history to make its rise inevitable and make sense. So when we're talking about activist causes, we're talking about different ways we can try to make the world a better place. We not only need good ideas, we need good stories. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed this video. That was a bit of a more odd one than I've done usually. If you liked it, I would recommend that you go and check out the rest of the Dead Country series. There's some really cool ones in there and a lot of people seem to be really big fans of it. So if you haven't checked it out yet, you really should. Another thing I want to mention is that the So That Happened podcast, the one that disappeared about a year ago, is back. So if you want to hear myself, Emperor Tigerstar, and Cody from the Alternate History Hub talk about current events on Sunday nights, you can go to the YouTube channel for it and watch it live or watch the VODs after they're done, link in the description part. And of course, this video would not be possible if it wasn't for my amazing patrons. You are literally the ones who are keeping my rent paid, my cats fed, and are the only reason that I can do this as my job and that you can get these videos as often as you do or even at all. So if you want to help out, if you want to keep this engine running, go to patreon.com slash stepbackhistory and give as little as a dollar a month and you'll be able to see videos early, much like this one. Anyways, friends, have a great time and I'll see you next time for more Step Back.